the end of last time, we were ended up in chapter 15, and it was, you know, Jesus is dead at the end of 15. He is buried and he is sealed in a tomb. Um, it was the worst of all possible days for this group of terrified disciples. It just couldn't have gotten any worse. I mean, for the previous week, not seven days ago, they had gone from the soaring heights of the triumphal entry with people uh, celebrating Hosanna to the son of David. And it looked like after years of political oppression that a new day was dawning for Israel. But the joy melted away pretty quickly into plain confusion as Jesus didn't seem to live up to the, um, their expectations of the deliverer of, Is of Israel. And you know their chronology. If you've been in church at long, you've heard this uh, uh, you know, at Easter time all the time. You got the Last Supper and then Gethsemane. And then they witnessed their friend who had been with them for a long time, Judas, then um, come as, his, as the betrayer. They arrest Jesus, and then he's turned over to Pilate, for, or turned over to the um, Sanhedrin, and then to Pilate, and Herod, and back to Pilate. And Peter, the rock, he denies him, not once, but three times. And then we end up at the crucifixion scene with the brutal scourging, and the cross, and the disciples scattered in all different directions. They're gone. And um, then Jesus, we saw last time, at the end of the last time, that he voluntarily surrendered to death and died. He died. He breathed his last, and they buried him in a tomb. Now, sure, he had raised people from the dead, right? But he is the miracle worker, right? Now what? They had believed. They had trusted. They had given up everything. And now he was dead. And from their perspective at this moment in time, there is no coming back from this moment, or so it seemed. They were crushed in their minds. This was over. And, what it, and that's exactly what it looked like from their perspective at that moment, to be sure. So if you were here with us last time, we were in the uh, uh, last time a year ago. This time we were in the back half of the book of Esther. By this time, and it looked like things were really bad. And that story, I remember the story of Haman. Uh, the plot was to get rid of all of Israel and to uh, kill Mordecai and all of that. But that's when, at that ending moment, we saw God step in. Right? We saw Him step in and reverse everything. He changed it. And there were so many reversals that happened right in those last few chapters. And by the end of the story, everything that was plotted against Israel is completely undone. Every evil intent, every uh, scheme, uh, everyone who was threatened and marginalized was eventually freed and exalted. Remember that? And it's a complete 180 in that story. And what we learn from Esther is that we, it's the same thing we learn from basically every story in the Bible, uh, in Scripture, that has impossible odds. And what we learn is, is they all foreshadow the greatest divine reversal of all, which is what we find in Mark 16. The cross at Calvary, right? Every, think about it. Satan thought he defeated Jesus. I mean, that all that was evil was celebrating, and they, he thought that he had dealt the biggest blow to the plan of God, and it looked like Satan had won. The story wasn't over. The story wasn't over at the end of Mark 15. And what we learn in all of these stories is that just when it seems to be darkness, that is when God comes on the strongest. And so that leads us to the final chapter, Mark 16, and where we're going to look at all, that the reversals that we see in this little short chapter here. And uh, so I want to start with and look at these resurrection reversals uh, as we go through these, chap uh, these verses here. And the first resurrection reversal we see in here is that what was dead is now alive. Now this is not just what was dead, Jesus being dead and then resurrected. There's more to it than that. We see this started in verse 1 when the Sabbath was over. Now we've seen all along in Mark that he gives us these time-orienting phrases so we can kind of tell what the chronology is. But beside the obvious that Jesus was in the tomb and then he was alive, there's another, um, um, what we see here is more than that. 
that this Sabbath day when Jesus rose on the first day of the week is not just any other Sabbath of the whole rest of the year. According to Leviticus 23, there are three uh, feasts that happen in conjunction uh, right here with Passover. And they are Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then down here what we call the uh, Feast of festival of first fruits and we talked about passover and the feast of unleavened bread as we were moving through talking about the last week of of uh, of the um story leading up to the crucifixion and now the first uh the the festival of first fruits falls on that first day of uh the week and so the point of the festival of first fruits if you don't know is to that they brought a portion of the first grain from the harvest to the temple and the priest, acknowledging that God is the one who provided the harvest and symbolizing at the same time that there was more to come, okay? So that means that if there's a first fruits, there's going to be a second fruits, third fruits, and so on like that. And so it fulfills symbolically the prophecy, uh, the, the prophecy here that Christ rose from the dead on this day. And, and it, what it's telling us is that on the on the day of resurrection, he is the first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. So at the, on this day, Jewish men would be ascending the steps of the temple, bringing their acceptable offering. That is the very first stalk of barley. They would cut it off and they would bring it to the priest and wave it in front of them. And so and he would wait for it in front of the offering. Uh, I'm sorry, in front of the altar as an offering, and so this is what it exact is, is that G Jesus rose from the dead on the festival of the first fruits, and that, so he, they were looking forward to what was coming in the harvest, and so in the same way, way when Jesus died, he ascended the steps of the heavenly temple to present himself as the acceptable offering, the first to rise from the dead, and in promise of what was to come. Now, Paul unpacks this much more clearly in 1 Corinthians 15. What he says here is, For since death, death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ the first, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. So you see the reversal there? That in Adam we all die, but in Christ we're all made alive. Jesus' triumph over death in his resurrection isn't just merely a display of power, but Christ is the first fruits from the dead and the pledge of great of the greater harvest to come. So through his death, we can know for sure and be confident that one day as believers and followers of him, that we too will rise from the dead. And that his resurrection was that first fruits presented at the holy temple. And it is evidence, just like he did, that we one day will have a bodily resurrection. So what is dead is now alive. The second... Uh, Resurrection reversal is what was blocked is now open, and that's Mark 16, verses 2 and 3. Now, like I just said a minute ago, this Sabbath had to be the worst day. Such anguish and sadness, but on the first day of the next week, these women followers do the only thing that they knew to do, and that is finish preparing Christ's body for final burial, because Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, we talked about last time, they were under a time crunch, so they didn't finish the job all the way. They got mostly done, but the women say, uh, we're going to go make sure they did it right <laughs> and got it all the way done. And so they finish preparing, want to go and finish preparing his body. But they have been so consumed with grief and anguish with all that had happened in the last 24 hours, they really don't think... A, give much thought to how this is actually going to happen, right? Now, in the natural, they had a lot of valid concerns for how this is going to get carried out, because mainly because of the stone. That's what, they're, what the Bible says that is the issue, because getting the stone in front of the, the tomb is fairly easy. Now, this rock would be about 
weigh about a ton. But the way they did it was they positioned the, the, the rock that would cover the tomb kind of up on a little hill and they would dug, dig a trough down in front of where it was going to do going to go. So the guys, all they had to do is get together and push it and it would roll down into the hill, around, down this little trough and, and go in position in front of the tomb door. And But getting it up is a, another problem, right? So getting it up that hill was a whole lot harder. And so the other Gospels also tell us that there was a seal on the tomb and there was a Roman guard there. So there's lots of concerns these ladies had. But they had kind of forgotten about Christ's prediction of his resurrection and his power. Um, so, so we see later on that none of their fears actually materialized because what was blocked was opened by God. And so we see, go on in verse 4, in five, um, this heavy rock was really moved through no effort of the women at all. Now, for just for clarity, sometimes you hear in songs or you hear people imply that the stone was moved and then Jesus walked out of the tomb, implying that Jesus needed an exit to get out of the grave. But the Gospel of Matthew tells us clearly that the one who moved the stone is an angel of the Lord, so, but it wasn't to let Jesus out. I mean, think about it. It would be silly to think Jesus needs somebody to help him to get out of the grave, right? It's like the, he had power over the wind and the waves and the sea and over death and life, and he commanded uh, 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 demons and angels, and he didn't need somebody to help him get out. He could get out if he wanted to. So the stone wasn't moved for him. The stone was moved for the women and the disciples, and by faith, all of us, right? So we could see into the tomb that he wasn't still there. Because it's one thing to stand outside of the sealed tomb and say, yeah, he rose from the dead, right? And we go, yeah, I don't know. But to walk in and see that he's gone, now you got evidence, right? Um, so, and they could see then and be reminded that he rose from the dead, just like he said, he would. And what the women found is that their fears about how they were going to get in were gone, right? And aren't we like these women? This is kind of a little aside. We worry and we fret and we're anxious about so many things. Have you ever lay, lie awake at night and worried about something that was just bothering you? You couldn't sleep and it's some big, huge stone that's in the way and we worry and we worry and then when we get there, right? The stone has already been moved most of the time, right? God moves things out of the way sometimes without any effort or us at all. And a lot of times we end up angsting over things because we want our solution to the problem and won't let him give us the solution that we really need. And, you know, what we do is we forget to factor God into our anxious problems. And so often what results sometimes, it, most of the time is that he's got a different plan or different outcome in mind and we have a different goal and we're angsting over what we want to happen over here where he's like, okay, I got it taken care of and I want you to go that way. And so that's so important to remember. Remember what Matthew tells us with man, it's impossible with God, all things are possible. And we talked about this a little bit back when we were talking about the feeding of the 5,000, but it's a good reminder to take away on this last night of our lessons. When we come up against something that seems impossible, um, we angst over it because we weigh the problem against our ability or our intellect or our plans, and we forget to factor our Savior into the equ equation. You know, the biggest thing that we have to remember is that God never promises his wisdom, his insight, or his plans, or his power, or strength to do anything outside his will. A lot of times we're thinking about things that we want to happen that are outside his will. And if you want to know if it's in your will or not, start with the book, right? Start with <laughs> sifting what you want through his word, because um, there's some things that just don't make the cut, right? Like, Anything materialistic or vengeful or self-focused, those things are going to be outside of his will and his power is not available to do those things. And you're thinking, wait a minute, doesn't he promise to meet all my needs? He absolutely does that. 
If you look in the New Testament, what he said was that he provides our needs and meets our needs as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And as we focus upward, focus on him, then he says all of the things we need will be met. Now, it's not all the things we're going to need be met the way we want it to, but he'll provide what we need. But the orientation always needs to be upward and not horizontally on the things that we need. So in that really what Paul gets at when he talks about prayer, he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, that's every, that means all, that's all inclusive, prayer, petition, thanksgiving, present your request upward to God. And when we do that, his promise is that he floods us with his peace, which transcends all understanding, and it guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the focus is always on God and not our ability to move any kind of obstacle, move any kind of stone out of the way. Um, because when you put anything you face against the backdrop of the character and the promises of God, then anxiety, like Paul says, begins to drain away. So next resurrection reversal is what was a hopeless end is now an endless hope. So we know from verses 2 and through 3 that they go to the tomb to add spices to the, complete the burial. Uh, and that tells us right there, um, they're not expecting resurrection. Because if you're going to look for resurrection, you don't take spices with you, right? You're not taking burial spices with you if you think I'm gonna, he's not going to be there. So <laughs> their hopes are dashed and hearts are crushed. Like I've said, you really can't overemphasize this. They had to be broken in this moment. And because uh, uh, Mark includes here in verse 4 at the beginning of it, but when they looked up, okay? <laughs> um, now, this is an, another unimportant detail. It tells us a lot about their demeanor, right? So if you've ever had a disappointing thing or you've had a lot of heartache, what is your body language look like, right? right? Your sl shoulders are slumped. You look down. Your head is down. A lot of looking at the ground, right? That's the way we look when we feel discouraged. That's what's going on here with them. They're walking there. They're down. And then they get to the tomb and they look up. <laughs> and, um, and so they arrive at the tomb and they mainly see that their concerns about the tomb door are unfounded. And so they head into the tomb still not expecting to see anything amazing, right? They're just happy that the tomb door is open. And when they get in there, everything changes, right? I mean, they see this young man dressed in white. And Mark uh, Matthew tells us it's an angel. And then it says that they were alarmed. Now, I think that's kind of a funny word right there, alarmed. I'm thinking terrified is probably more like it. <laughs> I mean, if you, they had to be scared in this moment. And then the angel speaks speaks directly to them, don't be alarmed, he said. And so he addresses this immediate fear, but I think he's also addressing the underlying fear that they had to have there. Because the way the sentence is constructed here in the original is, it says don't be alarmed, but what it generally means is to stop an act that's already in pro process. And so there, he's speaking to their alarm or their fear that's been going on probably, probably since Friday night, right? I mean, they had a lot of fear all the way back to when this whole thing got stirred up here. So still ringing in their ears has to be the words of the Pharisees who go, he saved others, but he can't save himself. And they got to think, yeah, that kind of happened, right? <laughs> he didn't save himself. Maybe they're thinking the same thing. Have we been duped by this guy? I mean, we gave up three years of our lives to follow him, and now he's dead. What are we going to do now? What were those last three years about anyway? I mean, all this stuff's going to be swirling around in their heads. And the first thing he says is, don't be alarmed or don't be afraid. Certainly of him, but I think he's talking about more than that. Uh, and he's trying to give him, them a comforting message that kind of speaks to those deeper fears because of what he says next. He doesn't say, don't be afraid or don't be alarmed of me. I'm not going to hurt you. Or he doesn't say, don't be alarmed. I've been sent from God. He doesn't talk about himself at all. What he does is he speaks to that underlying fear there. He's like, I know you're looking for Jesus who's crucified. I know you're looking for Jesus who you think is dead. That's what he's saying here. He said, but he said he's not. He's risen. He's not dead. He's 
alive. And he's saying, don't be afraid that you've believed in vain. Don't be ever afraid of what's going to happen now. Don't be afraid. Come, see for yourself. Right here's where he was. He's not here. Remember, he did exactly what he told you he was going to do. Now, we often want to give these disciples a hard time like, didn't you remember he told you this three times? But the truth is, we all have moments of doubt, right? Now, it isn't usually doubt of resurrection itself. It's not that theological when we have doubts, right? It's usually emotional. But it's doubt just the same. Like, what if he doesn't do what I, he said he would do? Or what if he doesn't come through in this moment I need him? What if I've believed in vain? What if? What if? What if? You've heard these things in your own head. I know you have. The message is to us is the same as the message it was to them. Don't be afraid. Jesus has proven his power and his trustworthiness in ways that you can see, the ways that you know, the ways you can be confident in. And most importantly, he has proved his love once and for all. Now, how did he do that? Romans 5, 8, you probably know this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. In what? While we were sin sin yet sinners, Christ died for us. This verse states plainly that Christ's death is what proves the love of God for you. We don't have to lean on some fuzzy, emotional, warm feeling or some poor assessment of what our circumstances look like. Um, the cross is an outward, objective, concrete exhibition of the love of God. And let me tell you, if you don't ever get another prayer answered to you by God, this is enough to prove his love for you once and for all. So now the answers to your prayer, they are amazing, wonderful grace and mercy that God pours out to us over and over and over again. But the answers you get, the way you want them, is not proof of his love. The cross is. <laughs> Don't forget that. It will save you a lot of angst, a lot of doubt, if you will remind yourself the truth of this one verse. Write it down underline it and make a note of it. Say it out loud if necessary. <laughs> See, whenever you're feeling that this, this idea that, you know, this thing is not going the way I want it to, now God might not be for me anymore, go back and read Mark 15 and 16 again and say out loud to yourself, yes, he is. And right here is proof. He does love me because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And in that moment, like it was for those women, our feelings that if we were at a hopeless end are transformed into endless hope that goes beyond any sorrow, any heartache, any frustrations, and reaches forever into eternity. So, moving on, resurrection reversal is what was scattered, is now gathered, and verses 7 and 8 is where we're going to end our discussion for tonight. And you're going, and if you were wondering about, why won't you talk about snake handling? <laughs> well, if you're waiting for that, I'm sorry. We're not going to talk about that. Because as I was studying this section, what I found is that there is serious, serious doubt about whether the verses 9 through 20 were written by Mark at all. Um, so scholars conclude that this section was probably added by people who uh, were frustrated at about how abrupt Mark ends his letter. And if you have your paper Bible, or if you even read it online, you'll see a little break between verses 8 and 9 that'll say that there's a lot of issues about it. And the issues that I read about it is there's a lot of style differences between what comes before and verses 9 through 20. Uh, some phrases that uh, wouldn't be consistent with first century language are in there, and uh, most of the objections are in that vein. And so, but what I found is that we as mere people don't need to try to help God out by finishing the story, right? <laughs> by writing a satisfactory conclusion uh, to make us feel better. What we as readers need to do is 
to understand what he did right. That's our job, and not to change it. Now, what he says here, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going to head of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, I get this. I get this. And I'll tell you, honestly, this right here is why I never really liked the, the book of Mark. Because of the ending. I mean, it's like, it's like, wait, wh where's the appearance of a Jesus? I mean, where is, now, like Matthew and John, you know, that he commissions them to go out and spread the gospel, or that he promises he's going to be with us till the end of the age. I mean, he kind of wants some more, right? <laughs> but remember, Mark is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right, when he wrote this. And so what he, he wrote what he was supposed to write. So it's a little presumptuous of us to think we could have ended it better than the Spirit of God, right? I mean, he had him write what he was supposed to write. Now, we kind of start understanding why he ended it like this when we go back and remember who he's writing to. Remember, he's writing to the church at Rome. And, he, and, and when he wrote this, remember this, I told you at the very first lesson that this is the first gospel to be written only 15 or 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So it's not like his readers didn't know what happened, right? I mean, they're in the church at Rome 15 or 20 years later. It's not like we're reading this and going, okay, I don't know how it ended. So in fact, the book of James and six other letters of Paul are already in circulation in these churches. So they know what's going on, and specifically they know the events that happened here, and they were common knowledge. And if we look at the Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says here, I received, I passed on to you of first importance, and this he gives the chronology here. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, he raised from the, on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and the twelve. And when I compare this with what's in Mark 16, 1 through 8, it matches perfectly. So what he says here is, if you look here in verse 15, he says he died for our sins. The angel says, you're looking for Jesus who, cru who was crucified. Um, then, then he says he's buried. The angel says, come see where he was buried. And then Paul says he was raised on the third day. Mark says this, the angel says the same thing in Mark 16. Then he appeared to Peter, then the 12. And he tells him here, he actually speaks to Peter and tells him he's going to go ahead of you and you can meet him there. So perhaps he leaves the story the way it is. It's not because he got tired of writing or some ending got lost, as that's what some people think, um, that maybe it's because he's trying to draw us into the story here at the end. I mean, the letter receivers in that day, all the way up to now, don't have to angst and fret about what happened. I mean, we don't need to read this last verse here and go, those silly women, why didn't they go tell somebody? I mean, no one's going to know that Jesus rose from the dead because they didn't speak up. Right? I mean, no one's ever going to know what happened, and now the story of the gospel is all over. No, they did. They knew what happened just like we know what happened. And the Bible, by the way, the Holy Spirit knew he was going to inspire other gospel writers as well, right? So they would fill in the other things. So this is not an oversight in Mark's letter. Mark is not clumsy with his ending. I think it's really subtle. And this is so exciting to me, and I, I just want to help you see it too, because I, after I studied this and learned this, I was like, oh, this is my favorite part. <laughs> this is my favorite part. Because it ends like this, because it forces us back into the story to piece together the ending for ourselves and to think about it. We're supposed to be uh, good you know, understanding and, and think about these things, and we can see what, he, what Mark was trying to tell us, because remember, the whole point at the beginning of Mark's letter here is to give us evidence that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what it says in verse 1 of chapter 1. I've referenced several times here at the end on purpose. So let's go back and let me help you see what's going on here in verse 7. So the angel says, Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So the angel, uh, uh, where did the angel tell them to go and see Jesus at the end of Mark? In Galilee, right? In Galilee. He's not at the tomb. He's not at the cross. He's not in heaven. 
He is in a verifiable place that they can go to and see him. So we're not to make a shrine to the tomb of Jesus or hang out at the crucifixion site. We are to go where he calls us to go. So let's look at the significance of Galilee a little bit, and this will help you understand. So the summons to Galilee is first a call together because the disciples are spread all over the place. I mean, they ran, they hid, they were afraid. And so he's calling this group back together to come and see him in Galilee. And secondly, a call to commitment. Now, the cross and the empty tomb are about two miles outside Jerusalem, and they're all hiding in, the, in and around the Jerusalem area. Galilee is about 40 miles from where they are in Jerusalem. And so this is not an easy or short trip that they're going to have to do. This is a strenuous trek across some hazardous terrain. So it's going to take them a while to get there. So they're going to say, we're going to go find Jesus. It's, going to, it's not like I'm going to be there tomorrow. You're going to have to work at this and go uh, have a commitment to do it. Then he is a call to courage. And it's that because they are now coming out of hiding in order to get to Galilee. Remember uh, now, Ru all the stuff that took place around the crucifixion. Remember, Rome uh, is uh, put a seal on the tomb. They don't want any uh, problems within the community of the followers of Jesus. So they might be there looking out for them. Certainly, the leaders of of the and the temple guards and the teachers of the law are going to be looking for them. They're very well known here. And so going to Galilee is going to require that they have to leave their hiding places and risk exposure. And then it's a call to decide. Will they believe or not? Will they believe what these women had told them? Will they believe the message of the angel? Will they leave their doubts and their fears behind and embrace the truth that he might actually be risen from the dead? Because if they don't believe, they don't go, right? They stay hidden, right? This is a challenging command to first just to believe that he's actually risen, which is going to take a huge expression of faith here, and, and then go and follow through on Jesus' command to come to where he was. Now this, I think, is the key to understanding the end of the Gospel of Mark. Galilee is not a random place that Jesus just said, hey, come and meet me here. Galilee is really important. This, I love this part so much. So, <laughs> I'm so excited about it. It's like, this is just so wonderful. Galilee, go back to first, uh, Mark chapter 1. See what it says here. As we, Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, his brother Andrew, casting a net, for they were fishermen. Jesus says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If they want to see Jesus for themselves, they have to leave Jerusalem. They have to leave their fear. They have to leave their doubts and their hiding places and go where he leads, which for them and for us is often back to the beginning. It is a call to renew their faith and follow Jesus again. I just love that. We're going to have our moments of fear. We're going to have doubts. We're going to have failure. Remember that the angel uh, uh, singles out Peter in verse 7. And why is that? Because Peter felt disqualified at this moment. We spent a whole session one time talking about the restoration of Peter, but that hasn't happened yet. He is still sitting in a lot of discouragement and, and, and overcoming feelings of shame here. And so Peter, the angel says, make sure you tell Peter that he's included too. He's included too. Come to Galilee. Come back to the start. Learn to follow again. To renew your relationship with him. To leave that shame and that fear and that doubt and all of that worry behind. And I love that so much because the parallel for us is that we have fears and anxieties and failures and shame and all of that too, right? And the, and, and the good news here is that God never cuts off the relationship. He says, come back, come back, enjoy it again. Go back to the beginning of our relationship. It was brand new and exciting. When the, uh, I'll start over with you. That's what he's saying here. And it requires for us the same thing that it required for them. And we have to have the courage to believe what Jesus said 
and the faith enough to step out and start over again. So you see, Mark 16 is, um, is not an ending. It is just the beginning. Remember back to first, verse 1 of chapter 1, Mark writes that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And here at the end of the letter, you know what? We're back at the beginning again. The resurrection sets in motion a new story that is not finished until the day Christ returns. It will not be completed until all that is scattered, all his followers, are gathered together again, like he said in Mark 13, when he talked about the end of time. So we don't need to wrestle with how Mark 16 concludes, right? We, and we don't need to come up with our own version of how we think it should end. What is so beautiful in this moment and so stirring and so challenging, if we'll just dwell in these little eight verses for a moment and absorb it, is that the ending of Mark forces us into the story to see that we are the conclusion. We are the conclusion. The story was handed to us from, by, from people who came before us, and then we are stewards of it now, and we will pass it on to the people that come behind us. This is our charge. This is our challenge. This is where Mark leaves us. What will you do? Do you have the courage to go? Do you have courage to leave the fears and the failures and the shame, all of that behind, and meet him where he calls you back at the beginning? So the final question of our study is, will you, what will you do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? It's where we started, and it's where we end. We are at the end back at the beginning. So what are we going to do? Be fearful? Be immobilized by shame? I know some people carry this stuff for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, believing that God is never going to forgive you, but that's a lie. God forgives you, restores you, wherever you are. Go back to the beginning. Don't carry the guilt with you for the rest of your life. Don't hide and hope that no one finds you out. Don't be afraid of what people are going to say, whether it be your family or your friends or your co-workers or whoever it is. Don't be a living fear. Will we decide to set all of those things aside and go meet him back at the beginning? To start fresh. To catch the vision of his calling again. And then go do your part. Actually, be part of writing the end of the story. Amen? Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you never give up on us. You never cast us aside. You never get tired of us. You get tired of dealing with us. That you are always full of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And your very best thing is restoration. God, thank you for that. And thank you that you call us back to the beginning and you allow us to be part of your story. What an amazing, mind-blowing thing that is that you allow us with all our faults and failures to be part of telling the greatest story that was ever told. God, give us courage. Give us faith. Stir us up when we're, we've been, if we've been too busy, too distracted, don't care. God, help us erase all of those things and listen to your call. There's still a small voice inside of us that says, come and follow me again. And we trust you that you will give us what we need to do just that. And we pray in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.